Thank you all for joining another conversation with the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club, Reading for a Liberated Future. My name is Dr. Carmen Rojas, and I'm the president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Today, I'll be in conversation with Thelma Young Lutunatambua and Rebecca Solnit, who edited Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. This anthology features interviews and essays from over one dozen indigenous activists, climate scientists, and longtime organizers. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our wonderful co-sponsor, Seattle Arts and Lectures. Seattle Arts and Lectures is committed to engaging and inspiring readers and writers of all generations in the greater Puget Sound region. I also want to share a little bit about Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation is working towards a country where our government prioritizes the needs of excluded and underrepresented people. In order to achieve that vision, we support organizations, scholars, leaders, and initiatives focused on shifting the balance of power in society, building power for communities who continue to be excluded from shaping how society works and from sharing in its rewards and freedoms. We're so proud to be able to support authors like Thelma and Rebecca by purchasing and sharing their work with our beloved community. Marguerite Casey Foundation is committed to providing over a thousand free copies of their book to a mix of registered guests and community-based organizations. And we are so thrilled that those joining today can access its vital messages as well. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Thelma. Hello. Good <laughs> to be here. Hello. It's great to be with you all. I'm going to start with a question um, about like the framing of the story. I think in this moment, there is a, a constant feeling that the climate crisis is a, a narrative or a story of doom and despair. And you all actually opened this, this book, this anthology, by describing this as a love story. Uh, what does this mean to you all, and why did you just try, decide to write a love story about the climate crisis? We didn't set out to write it as a love story. It kind of came out of the process. We wanted to write a book that helped be a bomb for the soul of people mm. who are struggling. We wanted to write something to also be a portal and a guide uh, so people could know how they can step up and use their talents and be a part of this moment. Um, but it was through all our interviews and, and through the process of working with our, with our collaborators that so many of them brought up again and again, we have to center love mm. as part of this work. Um, and so it was really beautiful to see it. There were actually two major themes that just kind of emerged that everyone brought up. It was mm -hmm. love. This work has to be grounded in it. This movement is powered by so many people who are, who are doing it because they love. They love their community. They love their homes. And they're not giving up. Mm -hmm. And the other big thing that came up was community, as we can't do this alone. We have to do this acting together as communities, finding our power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think... People talk about anger and fear a lot in relationship mm. to climate and a lot of other political issues, but you don't have fear um, for what will happen to something you don't care about. You're not angry mm. if something you don't care about is being hurt. So those are kind of reactive emotions that are still grounded in love and getting past them to the love, I think gives people something much more sustainable to do the work to know why they're here, to know why it matters, and to know who they are. Mm. I want to stay with you for a second, Rebecca. Throughout, I feel like you do a brilliant job of tethering the exploitation of poor people around the world with climate destabilization and the climate crisis that we're now facing. Can you share a little bit more about that link for uh, audience members and future readers who these connections may not be as apparent? Yeah, I think one of the really complicated things right now is that one of the smallest words we use all the time, we. Who yeah. is the we in the climate crisis? One, one way that the we gets confusing is when they say we're all responsible for climate chaos, but yeah. the richest 1% of human beings have twice the impact of the poorest 50% of human beings. So the we who's causing the problem is not uh, sort of, you know, homogenous we. And then um, 
you know, who's actually being impacted. There's still a way a lot of people in the global north and people who are leading pretty secure lives talk about climate change as though it's this thing that's going to happen mm. uh, one day. But I live in California where we have people displaced by flooding right now. We've had horrendous fires and freak weather. I know most places on earth have had it. It's in the present, but of course it's people and the uh, Pacific Islands, the tropics, the Arctic, et cetera, and indigenous people, people in the global south who are most impacted. So I think just being really educated about what we mean by we when it comes to impact, to responsibility, to who's doing what, to what we can do um, is really important. I have to say one of the things that I so appreciated throughout is that I, I um, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but this very important need to shift our perspective from uh, consumer to citizen to community member, right? Like that these things, exactly. that there's like a exactly. real powerful choice that we have to make that's above and beyond the things that we choose to buy and towards the way that we love each other, right? Like that, uh, I, um, I found the book and the essays in the book like a like a clear to be a clarion call in service of this collective vision um thelma in in the essays uh and throughout there's like such a broad cross section right so to have uh indigenous uh organizers write about this to have climate scientists write about this uh i love that you are you both have been able to create a powerful tapestry of people with different um, understanding, placement, language, uh, but with some uh, common set of commitments and values to a collective future with a climate that is intact and which we're in which we are all stewards of it. And I'm wondering uh, if you would be open to sharing some of the lessons that you want readers to take away from the essays in the book. Yeah, the collaborators are really our dream team, and it's a really amazing group of people. So I really hope people enjoy it. One big takeaway we want people to feel is the reassurance and the knowledge that we have the solutions. Climate change is a massive problem, but the solutions exist. And our, our um, contributors talk about both the technical solutions, the tech solutions, the, the policy solutions, but all this, also the solutions that exist on a much deeper community level. People like Jay Begay who talk about uh, indigenous traditions and how they can be guideposts in the new economies um, and the new uh, social structures that we need to build. The solutions have been around for millennia, and so we just need to resurface those. So if you are you know, ever wondering what can we do about this problem, this book is a guide for, again, the tech, the policy, the spiritual solutions that already exist. We don't have to invent that many more things. The solutions are here. So that's a huge theme. It's a super exciting spread. Another thing that comes up, um, and again, that makes me so happy, is the, the power and the importance of beauty and creativity mm. and pleasure and imagination in this work. Um, so often people see climate activists as folks who are angry and maybe a little bit dreary and kind of that grumpy person in their life, um, when actually we want to fight for a world that centers beauty. Mm. Um, both Rebecca and I love the old phrase of we need bread, but we need roses too. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have several speakers and contributors who, who talk about this, like Adrienne Marie Brown in our interview with her. She talks about how to maintain hope. You have to microdose pleasure. Um, the Pacific Climate Warriors, Joseph and Fenton, they also talk about this and how that there's spaciousness for people's talents, for their creativity, their spaciousness for beauty and joy. And so as we are visioning the world that we can create, uh, we don't want to just stop emissions and, you know, save the planet. We want to create a livable, beautiful, healthy, vibrant, creative planet. Mm. And so these are important parts of this work also. Mm. Rebecca, I'd love to ask you the same question. Like, what are the some of the takeaways uh, from pulling together this book that 
are sticking with you and that you feel like are really critical to share more broadly? We started this book with the perspective that people need both good facts and good frameworks about climate. And I think a lot of the despair, anxiety, grief, et cetera, come from lack of both of those things. You can't have really, the facts alone won't do it. So we have absolutely brilliant people on the facts, on policy, on strategy, on renewables, two IPT scientists who are absolutely brilliant. But it's also a question of frameworks. Where does power lie? How does change work? So one thing Thelma and I really converged on as we worked on the book is one of the frameworks that's very pervasive in the climate world, and I think the kind of global north in general, is that we now live in an era of glorious uh, um, abundance, Mm. and we have to sacrifice for the climate. And of course, a lot of people living on Earth right now are not even in material abundance. And I think a lot of people who are in material abundance are living lives of loneliness, of anxiety, Mm. of alienation, of uh, lack of hope, lack of connections to nature and community. And you can stand that story on the head. And these 20 writers helped us do exactly that. Mm. They, there are many ways we now live in an era of austerity and doing what the climate requires of us, which is not just electrifying everything, although Dr. Leah Stokes is absolutely brilliant about that, but really changing how we think about what constitutes abundance, what are what are our mm. values, how do we how do we understand what indigenous people always have? And some of them in the book tell us that everything we do, we need to think about the well-being of the whole because mm. everything is connected rather than the, the kind of extractivist mentality of, you know, the kind of selfishness that drives Exxon and Chevron, mm-hmm. a lot of capitalism, um, business philosophy, et cetera. So these 20 people helped us expand in various ways. Um, but we really arrived with a pretty clear agenda, Mm -hmm. uh, which was, you know, the relationship between facts and frameworks to give Mm -hmm. people both a kind of emotional care, because Thelma and I are nice and nurturing people and want particularly young people to stop feeling so bad about climate. But we want them to feel stop feeling so bad, because so often they feel so bad in the sense of there's nothing we can do, because it's too late. We don't have the tools, we don't have the solutions, no one cares, et cetera. We also want to build an on-ramp for everyone to get involved, everyone to find a place in the movement. Mary Anais Heglar, one of our amazing writers, um, has an article specifically about finding your place in the climate movement and that everybody has a role, everybody has something to contribute. Yeah, uh, I, again, like I, uh... I treated the book as an invitation, uh, which I'm so excited to to accept and to be able to share with folks more broadly. Uh, on that note, Rebecca, on the note specifically about the role of corporations, the role of capitalism, I want to circle back to this earlier point about the desire of companies like Exxon and Chevron to... Uh, to have us disassociate, to have us be less connected to to each other, to have us only uh, be in relationship with each other uh, as people who consume as opposed to citizens of a planet, people who love, people who care, people who dream of something more. And the the sheer amount of resources spent by major corporations to trick us into thinking that getting uh, off of fossil fuels is a sacrifice Um, What do you think is important that people understand about these messages? So as you think about uh, facts and frameworks, specifically this, the the point around fossil fuels, I feel like is one that in the in the U.S. context, we're always asked to frame it in the form of a sacrifice as a as opposed to a form of uh, survival, a form of of self-love. Um, can you share a little bit more about why corporations and how corporations are using this, this messaging to, to limit our place and power as citizens and people who want to, want to live to live, to have a good life in another day? Absolutely. There's really two pieces to your question. One of them is about what I think of as privatization, which was talked a lot about in the first decade of this millennium 
as privatization of resources, public transit, education, etc. But you can't convince people that things like that should be private unless you privatize people's sense of themselves, mm. unless they start to believe Margaret Thatcher's there's no such thing as society. I think what makes us really good consumers who buy a lot of stuff um, is being alienated and miserable and lonely and trying to stuff those holes full of things money can buy. But I think a happy life comes from the things money can't buy, relationships, connections, nature, um, love, joy, um, you know, your garden, your your quality of life um, not being so overworked, you have no time. We're really poor in time right now, a lot of us in the global north. So, and then the other piece of that is, um, you know, not only that they're always telling us the only power we have is individual, um, what we do in our, pri our privatized lives. I was really amazed to find out that the fossil fuel companies themselves were really pushing the whole climate footprint thing. When you ask people, what are you doing about climate? They're like, oh, I recycle, I'm vegan, I bicycle, etc. But that's kind of what you do staying at home, not impacting the fossil fuel corporations, which is exactly where they want you. Mm. They don't care if you recycle, they prefer you not vote, and they really don't want you to become a climate activist demanding that we exit the age of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So as you pointed out, one of the crucial transformations I think we need in this culture is to regain that sense of citizenship, which for me is never about your nationality, your legal status, et cetera, but is about, do I feel a sense of belonging to the greater whole? Do I feel like a member of civil society? I wrote a book about disaster a dozen years ago, and what was so moving to me is to find in the worst of times, people often light up with joy because even though their city has just been hit by an earthquake or a hurricane in taking care of each other in mutual aid, et cetera, they find the sense of belonging, meaning, purpose, and connection mm. that's missing in everyday life. I think those are our deepest needs and no corporation is gonna sell it to you, sell those things to you, although they might try and sell you ersatz versions of them or t-shirts mm. about them. Mm. I feel like um, uh, in this conversation and, and throughout the book, it's, it's like a, a constant feature of quote unquote good citizenship and the way that you're describing it, Rebecca, is a, a need to see yourself as one part of a whole and to take collective action in service of that, right? That it's not like the disassociated, disembodied individual, but that it's uh, us all coming together and grappling uh, and making meaning and moving forward together. Uh, and frankly, like holding the most powerful amongst us uh, accountable for the harms and pushing them uh, to make a different set of choices or frankly not have the power that they currently have. Um, Thelma, I, I wanna turn to you. We're in, the, we're in this really crazy moment uh, in which we're experiencing the largest public investments in a generation, uh, including the $700 billion Inflation Reduction Act, much of which goes to combating climate change. You write that the act includes both good and bad provisions. Can you share a, an example of each? Yeah, it is an exciting time. Um, the IRA has some great provisions to help us shift our economy off of fossil fuels and help us electrify everything. Um, exciting um, incentives for people to get heat pumps, inside of, and exciting incentives for EV infrastructure, um, to get solar infrastructure into communities. So there's some really great parts of it. And what it's also doing, it's not just uh, this one-time thing, but we're seeing huge event investments on state and local levels as well. But there's also some pretty massive loopholes in there that allow for the fossil fuel industry uh, to step in and get a piece of this pie um, to kind of further their own false solutions. Um, one thing that the fossil fuel industry loves to tout is this idea of uh, carbon capture and storage. We can keep on emitting, it's okay, don't worry, we're just going to invent these technologies later that will help us suck all carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and again, we're, we're seeing that these technologies are not coming to light in the way that is hoped for. Um, 
but they're using it as a tool to help continue their own um, uh, corporate policies and their own ways of being. Um, it also allows loopholes and concessions to oil and gas companies mm -hmm. to continue drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and in Alaska. Um, and so it's exciting, um, but also has to be seen carefully. And, and one thing I, I do want to make clear, and which, um, again, this book is about also people power, is we can never rely on governments to get us all the way there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the Paris Agreement or any legislation, there's always going to be a gap that mm -hmm. is going to have to be filled by people power. Mm -hmm. um, so keep an eye on what your government's doing and then push for more mm -hmm. because we're at this pivotal, pivotal moment in history and uh, small measures or even medium measures are, are not enough. We need rapid, rapid change to our whole economy to get us to where we need to be. So um, keep on pushing, organize with your communities, fill those loopholes. Um, it was amazing to see the immense of immensity of people power that came up to take a stand um, against Joe Manchin and, and everything in the pipelines he was pushing through. Um, it was amazing to see people standing against the Willow Project. And even though Biden approved it, uh, lawsuits are being filed by multiple organizations. Um, and so no matter what's going on, we have to organize. We have to find the power of our communities to get us to where we need to be. Mm, I think one of the things that I've been grappling with is, is uh, the thing that you're pointing to, which is the tremendous amount of resource in this moment and that without collective action, without organizing, without people power, uh, it may be for naught. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, a related thing, which is these are our dollars. You know, like it's not like the federal government just all of a sudden has like a, a magical machine of dollar making. We all, many of us pay taxes and to have, uh, we should have the ability uh, to actually inform how these dollars are used, not to harm and hurt and poison us, but to make sure that people can live the kinds of lives that you all are describing through this book, lives of dignity, lives of opportunity, lives of dreams, right? Um, and so thank you. I, I want to close with um, uh, a question about uh, an interview that you mentioned earlier, Thelma, with Adrian Marie Brown, who encourages us, who encourages us to uh, douse ourselves with pleasure uh, and to maintain hope even in this moment, that it's like a necessary precondition. Uh, as we close, could each of you share an example of what this practice looks like for you in your life? Yeah, I mean, um, the simple answer is uh, my, my child, my baby, um, I was pregnant when we put this book together, uh, gave birth two months after we finished the first, first draft of the manuscript. Um, and so I had this new child in my life. And so uh, spending time each day being present with him um, out in nature, out in the world, being present with his smiles um, and using also the love I have for him to be also a fire in my activism to, to keep me going. Um, and one more interview I love in this book is a conversation with the poet, uh, Kathy General Kitchener, who's also a mom. And she talks about finding that balance of uh, fighting for a better world, but also being present with your children. Mm. Um, and so for me, the pleasure I take in is just by my son's smile um, and laughter. And, and again, taking that into my heart and using it also as fuel. Mm. Rebecca? Yeah, I've been writing about hope and thinking about hope hard for the last 20 years. And so my answer is probably a little more cerebral than Thelma's. Um, and for me, a lot of hope comes from the past. We can't know the future, which for me is hopeful. There's often in despair a sense that you know exactly what's going to happen. Mm you know, or pessimism, and but also optimism. I see all those things as an assumption. We know what will happen, and therefore there's nothing to do. Optimism assumes it will be wonderful. Pessimism, despair, assume the opposite. But they assume, but we, history is full of surprises, and it's full of extraordinary achievements by ordinary people, 
banding together to create movements, coalitions, et cetera. One of the stories in the book we're so excited by is our friend Renato Constantino, who's a Philippines-based climate activist, mm -hmm. talking about how the climate vulnerable nations and a grassroots effort he was part of forced the world's nations to set the threshold for climate temperature rise to 1.5 degrees instead of two degrees, which was the intention when the Paris Treaty negotiations started. And then another one of our contributors, Julian Aguan, who's indigenous to Guam, and a lawyer and a poet and a completely amazing poet and, and a completely amazing person just won this huge victory this week. And the very short version of the story is that four years ago, a group of law students, not even full lawyers, on the tiny island nation of Vanuatu decided to not be passive in the face of climate change. They wrote a resolution that the Blue Ocean law firm Julian's part of took to the UN and it unanimously passed in the UN. It's a resolution to essentially take to the courts climate, climate damage and climate responsibility in a whole new way. Mm. And so I find the examples like this of what has happened, even, you know, and is happening, tell us what can happen. I find the memory that the world has changed so dramatically over and over gives me confidence that the world will change again, because another kind of despair comes from this kind of presentism, the sense that the way things are is inevitable, it's the way they always have been, mm. et cetera. And this is why with not too late changing the climate story from despair to possibility, we think frameworks are so important. And then lastly, my hope comes from the absolutely amazing people in the climate movement, the fierce integrity of so many of the young people around me, and the resilience and power of the natural world. I mm. live on a peninsula. I go to the ocean every week. I, I watch the birds in my backyard. Mm. I, you know, um, you know, so all these things add up. But I also, we're with Mariam Kaba, who says hope is a discipline. That's For me, it's like there are things outside that give me hope, but I also am not going to surrender as long as I have the chance to do otherwise. I will do my best to practice this discipline and to help other people practice this discipline. Mm. Um, on that note, uh, I want to thank you both so much for your time and wisdom, for bringing together the amazing people in this book. Uh, I've learned so much from you being in conversation and again from the... Uh, from like, again, I want to just call it like this tapestry, the way you all are able to bring together what on the surface feel like different people with different perspectives to create a common narrative of us is such a powerful tool. Uh, and I'm so excited that we get to share it with folks in our community. Uh, for folks who are watching, thanks for being a part of the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club. As always, our events are free and available on our YouTube page. For information on our past and future events, please check us out at caseygrants.org. On behalf of Marguerite Casey Foundation and all those who work hard to bring you our book club events, I thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.